Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV online education webinars. We would like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge and expertise with all, especially in such challenging times. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe days ahead, and we hope these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on internet speed, which might be at times unstable. Please bear with us for any issues with internet. All information and academics discussed in the webinar are sourced by the speakers from reliable sources. However, please use the information provided in the webinar only after confirming with standard teaching. The opinions in webinar are for academic purposes only and are not a substitute to evidence or experience. The speakers, neither the portal is responsible for any untoward events caused due to information presented in the webinar. Today, we have Jammu Kashmir Orthopedic Association webinar on conservative management of fractures. So I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Rajesh Gupta, Secretary of JKOA. Over to you, Dr. Rajesh Gupta. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before we start, uh, uh, I must introduce the uh, panelists uh, and the speakers. So uh, we have uh, with us uh, Professor DK Taneja, a very senior orthopedic surgeon. He's a past president of IOA and uh, also at present he's a is heading a WOC World Orthopedic Concern. So he is uh, with us in uh, every you know uh, plaster workshops which we are conducting for the last two years all over India. We have with us uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay Dhar. He is the son of the soil from Jammu and now based in Mumbai, and uh, he is heading a department in D.Y. Patel Hospital and Medical College. Welcome, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta. Dr. Sanjeev, unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we have with us Dr. Sanjeev Gupta. He is professor and head of Government Medical College, Jammu. We have with us Dr. Abdul Ghani. Uh, he is a professor of orthopedics again in Government Medical College, Jammu. Uh, I think Dr. Lavi Pada is senior uh, consultant orthopedics. Uh, will join us shortly, he's up having net problems. So I must thank uh, Dr. Neeraj and uh, Dr. Ashok, uh, you know, uh, for their, uh, uh, you know, valuable contribution in organizing this uh, uh, Ortho TV uh, webinar. So with these, uh, I think few words, uh, I will start uh, my presentation. We will be having two talks, one by me and then by uh, Dr. Taneja. And uh, then we will be having uh, some uh, case discussions also. So now I will start with my presentation. So, so I'm going to talk on a very, you know, basic uh, subject that is uh, principles of uh, uh, plaster application. So, a plaster application is a technical skill which can be easily acquired with practice. As we require practice, you know, for to sharpen our surgical skills, so is the case with the plaster application. The more we apply, the more we learn. To apply a proper plaster, we should have the knowledge of the basic principles. And if these basic principles are not followed, we may land up in risks and complications. Before applying any plaster, we must assess the extremity for displacement of the fractures, for any neurovascular deficits, for you know any abrasion or wound. And if a need is felt to have a splint or a cast, we must decide when and how to do it. Now, cast and splints, they serve to immobilize the orthopedic injuries. They are mainly indicated in the treatment of the fractures, soft tissue injuries, you know, like sprains, tendon lacerations, and to give rest to the part in some inflammatory conditions. The main aim of the cast and splints is to help in the alignment of the bone, to decrease the pain, promote healing, and to compensate for the surrounding muscle weakness. Now, there are few factors which influence the plastering. We will be discussing uh, them one by one. Now, if we immerse the plaster bandage in a cold water, 
the initial uh, set is delayed so thereby the working length is increased it is required when we are manipulating the fracture for reduction we can feel the fracture fragments in the you know, plaster cast while applying the plaster cast and we have to hold the reduction there for a while so we require the, the initial set to be delayed when we immerse the plaster bandage in a warm water there will be rapid set of the cast there are things you know where we can delay the setting we can add borax or resin and in a for a rapid set then we have to add some sugar the normal temperature in which we have to immerse the bandage is like lukewarm water and temperature is around 20 to 24 degree centigrade now strength and the rigidity of the cast depends on the interlocking of the crystals and interlocking of the plaster crystals that is the critical setting period begins when the plaster reaches the thick creamy stage becomes a little rubbery and start losing its wet shiny appearance so motion during the critical setting period interferes with this interlocking process and reduces the ultimate strength by as much as 77 percent so while applying plaster we don't have to move the extremity if we keep on moving the extremity while applying plaster the plaster will take a longer time to set and we may land up in applying more bandages so the plaster becomes heavy so the cast drying occurs by evaporation of the water the evaporation from the cast phase is influenced by air temperature humidity and circulation about the cast so if the temperature is more there is a more humidity the plaster remains wet and it may break early the thick cast take longer time to dry than the thinner ones and the strength increases as drying occurs now padding is very important padding protects the skin and the soft tissues during cast removal and it also protects the soft tissues from the thermal injury so if there is a poor padding it leads to pressure sores and if there is a over padding it leads to loose cast so we should have proper padding now the plaster of paris you know uh, bandage it is infinitely infinitely moldable and it can be set around a cast brace hinges and walking heels but for adequate strength when we apply the cast around a limb we have to wait for the cast to dry a bit and then we apply these appliances otherwise if we apply these appliances over a wet cast the cast will indent and it will lead to pressure sores on the underlying skin coming to absorption the excess exudates from inside and moisture from outside will weaken the cast and the cast will break early the strength of the pop builds up over a period of time as we know the drying the you no know, total drying of the cast or proper drying of the cast will take around 48 to 72 hours and if we allow the patients to wear bed before that the cast will break so we have to instruct the patients accordingly when and how to wear bed now we require this few material for uh, plasters like pop bandage or fiberglass crepe bandage casting gloves some water bandage scissors padding material sheets stocky net and adhesive tape so coming to stocky net it comes in different sizes for finger it is around 1 inch for upper extremity it is 2 to 3 inch and for lower extremity it comes in 3 to 4 inches padding also comes in different sizes for hand and foot it is 2 inches for upper extremity it is 2 to 3 inches and for lower extremity it is uh, 4 inches to 6 inches now pop also for hand and feet it is 2 to 3 inches for upper extremity it is 3 inch to 4 inch and for lower extremity we use 4 to 6 inches synthetic cast material uh, most frequently we are using these days for hand and foot it is again 2 to 3 inches for extremity 2 to th 3 to 4 inches and for lower extremity 4 to 5 inches there is no 6 inches bandage in a synthetic cast 
Now coming to pattern of application, what is a slab? Here POP encloses the partial circumference of the limb. Cast, here POP encloses the full circumference. Spica, it includes trunk and R1 or more limbs. And what is brace? It is a splintage which can allow motion at the adjacent joints. Now, interposition material, we can apply cast unpadded. Here, no material is interposed between POP and the skin. And it was practiced by Bohler. And Sir Charlie also recommended its use in the treatment of Collis fracture, scaphoid fracture, and Bannard fracture. The plea given by uh, these was it rigidly fixes the fracture. But the disadvantage is, is it is difficult to remove and it does not compensate for the swelling. So the current practice is used to use a padded cast. Here the interposed material may be stuck in it and wool both are only wool sometimes. Now, what is a slab? Slab is a temporary splint used in the initial stages of fracture treatment in first aid, sometimes in the post-operative period, and also in infections to give rest to the part. And it is prepared according to the required length. Now, there are three methods of applying slab. One is dry method. Here the slab is prepared first and then dipped in water. This is the commonly implied method. Wet method is here the slab is prepared after dipping the POP roll in water. This is rare and requires experience. Third is a pattern method. Here the slabs are fashioned in the desired way before dipping in water. So it is fashioned beforehand, cut to the desired length and shape before applying or before dipping it in water. Now, there are many ways uh, to apply a splint, but the, but the uh, commonest way, you know, the, the more common way is uh, apply a POP slab. Now, there's a video I'll show you how to apply a proper slab. Now, before applying any slab or the cast, we have to mark the proximal and the distal extent of the slab. Okay. You can apply some soothing agent like some powder or something like that. Now take an appropriate size stocking net. Roll it over the extremity. But the important thing here is there should not be any wrinkles or bunching in the stocking net. It should be absolutely smooth and it should extend around eight to 10 centimeter beyond the, beyond the marked level. So it should be very, very smooth. Now we take appropriate side cotton and then start applying it from distal to proximal. Again here, two important things, one, it should extend two to three centimeters beyond the mark level. It should be very smooth. There should not be any wrinkles or bunching. And it should cover 50% of the preceding layer so that it automatically gives two layers of the cotton. So it should cover 50% of the preceding layer. Then, At the ends of the plaster or the slab, we apply some extra cotton at both the ends and also apply the extra cotton over the bony prominences. This is important to prevent the irritation and the pressure source. So apply some extra cotton over there. Then you take the already prepared slab dip it in water and then squeeze out the extra water from the slab. Now apply it over the extremity. 
apply it over the extremity mold it to the extremity properly mold it to the extremity mold it to the extremity you have you have to hold the limb in a particular position in the functional position while applying a cast or a slab now after molding it you take an cotton bandage wet cotton bandage and start applying it from distal to proximal you can take the help of some assistant to hold the functional position or patient can hold for you start applying start applying the cotton bandage then you hold it for a few seconds or a few minutes so that it gets properly set hold it in the functional position this is very important okay now important thing is you have to fold back the extra stockinet and the cotton over the ends so as to give it a smooth surface so that the edges do not irritate the skin so that is why we keep the stockinet and cotton a bit long and then you apply this elastic bandage or cray bandage over the slab over the finish slab just to hold the things together so this is how a proper slab is applied presentation okay now another way to apply a splint is without the use of stockinet or circumflexion padding here the several layers of padding that are slightly wider and longer than the splint are applied directly to the smooth wet smooth wet splint and together they are molded to the extremity and secured with an elastic splint the third is there are nowadays you know pre packaged splints available in the market consisting of fiberglass and padding these are easily cut and molded to the injured extremity but they are bit expensive and fourth is there are prefabricated splints available uh, this is a simple option but they are less custom fit and they sometimes size may not fit properly to the patient and their use may be limited by cost or availability now coming to cost here it, it the pop completely encircles the limb and there are three methods of applying a pop cast the skin tight cast is same as unpadded cast it is same thing you know blogna cast here the generous amount of cotton padding is applied to the limb before putting the cast we apply lot of cotton you know but the three tire cast is a preferred method here we use the stockinet first over which cotton padding is done before applying a pop cast now what is spica it encircles a part of the body in a figure of eight fashion and the example is a hip spica for fracture around the hip and fracture shaft of the femur especially in children and thumb spica for fracture scaphoid what is a functional cast brace it is a functional cast brace provides immobilization but also promotes early activity and early joint motion and we are going to have talk by professor tanija on this after my talk now coming to splinting versus casting when considering whether to apply a splint or a cast the physician must assess the stage and the severity of the injury the potential for instability the risk of complications and the patient's functional requirements now splints use offer many advantages over casting they are faster and easy to apply may be static or dynamic 
Splints being non-circumferential allows for natural swelling that occurs during the initial inflammatory phase of the injury. So it is a preferred method of immobilization in the acute care setting. So whenever there is a fresh injury or a fresh fracture, we don't immediately go for the cast. We sometimes apply a slab and wait for a few days and then the swelling decreases, then we go for the cast. And splint may be removed more easily than a cast, allowing for regular inspection of the injury site. But what are the disadvantages? Lack of patient compliance and excessive motion at the injury site. Splints are inappropriate for definitive care of unstable or potentially unstable type of the injuries. So it is not for definitive care for this type of the injury. So mainstay of the treatment for the most fracture is costing. And it provides more effective immobilization, but it requires more skill and time to apply and have a high risk of complications if not properly applied. There are alternatives to POP. Most of these are fiberglass fabric impregnated with polyurethane resin. They are light, they are more durable, they don't break easily, and they are radiolucent. But the plaster has traditionally been the preferred material for splints and the cast. The plaster is more pliable and has a slower setting time than fiberglass allowing more time to apply and mold the material before it sets. Now, rules guiding plaster of Paris use. The surgeon should examine the limb and the fracture site, documenting any skin lesion and neurovascular status. So this is very important. Now, radiographs should be reviewed thoroughly to determine the fracture pattern. And the motion required to adequately reduce the fracture should be rehearsed ahead of the commencement of the procedure. POP should preferably be applied by the surgeon. Most of the time we leave it to the, you know, uh, the uh, plaster room technicians to apply the plaster, but it should be applied preferably by the surgeon. And procedure requires at least one assistant. The plaster should be snugly fitting and should not be too tight or too loose. And this is a loose cast in the you know, leg. This is giving rise to a Wellington boot type of the effect. Uniform thickness of the plaster is preferred. We cannot apply three or four layers at one place and then one layer at another place. This will give rise to the stress riser and plaster will break early. So uniform thickness of the plaster is preferred. It should be molded with the palm and not with the fingers for fear of indentation. So always mold with the palm. Don't mold with the fingers. And when you are holding a curing cast on your palm, on your hand, please hold it on the palm, not on the fingers. So this is again a very important part. Immobilize one giant blow and one above the reduced fracture, but there are exception to this. The giant should be immobilized in the functional position. After you have finished your cast, you have to check for the neurovascular status and do check for the X-ray for the acceptability of the reduction. Now, I'm going to tell you uh, cast application. Uh, I have demonstrated how to apply a scaphoid cast. So again, mark the proximal and distal extent as we have done in, you know, uh, slab application. Apply some soothing agent. Again, apply an appropriate size stockinet. It should extend eight to 10 centimeter beyond the marked level. The important step here is there should not be any wrinkling. It should be completely smooth. No wrinkles are bunching, otherwise it will lead to pressure source. Then take an appropriate size cotton roll and again start applying from distal to proximal and important point again here is little bit long, two to three centimeter beyond the marked level and it should cover the 50% of the preceding layer. 
there should not be any wrinkles or it should not you should not apply it like this it should be very very smooth so it should cover 50% of the preceding layer to give it two layers at one particular point or a site again apply some extra cotton at the ends of the cast and over the bony prominences like this i am applying here at the ends also apply some extra cotton so this gives an extra protection against rubbing of the cast at the ends so we have to hold the position you know whatever you want in a scaphoid cast we want a you know cup holding position in a scaphoid cast we also immobilize the uh, ip joint of the thumb so apply some cotton over there then we take an appropriate size plaster bandage and start applying from distal to proximal we have to bunch it a little bit here we have to squeeze it out at the edge at the end you should hold it you know in the center it should be the bandage should be held at the center and see how i am applying i am applying with my fingers no extra pressure on the bandage and what my this right hand thinner aminas is smoothing it out so when you apply a bandage you must smooth it out why you have to smooth it out there should not be any air pocket in the layers if there are air pockets this will lead to lamination and the cast will break so it is very important to smoothen the bandage after you apply first bandage then you apply second bandage see my thinner aminas is smoothing out out each each turn is being smoothened and when don't apply two three layers at one place that is what i have done here i'm going back and then apply again so don't apply more layers at one place it should be it has to be a rhythmic movement from distal to proximal again smoothen it out each each bandage you apply you again smoothen it out okay so this is very important smoothing now you roll back the stocking net and the cotton so that the sharp edges don't irritate the skin same and see if something is impinging somewhere and then we apply the final plaster layer so this is how a cast is applied this is a scaphoid cast okay now two three very important concept what is a bedging of the cast when you apply a you know a plaster in a fresh fracture and uh, there is unacceptable angulation or loss of reduction and cast is well fitting we need to do some wedging now the cast is at the point of you know angulation two third of the circumference of the cast is cut two third of the circumference of the cast is cut the wedge is opened and the wedge is held open with a wooden piece and then when you have corrected the deformity then you when then you repair it with a fresh plaster bandage and this is how we have corrected the 
fracture both bone forearm with the wedging. So this is the importance of wedging. Here, fracture both bone, distal part of the leg is corrected with the wedging. So we should know how to do proper wedging. Now, there are uh, many indices, you know, uh, described in literature, but the one you should know is a cost index. These are important to determine the proper molding of the plaster. And they will tell us the, whether the fracture is going for, you know, failure or not. Fracture reduction is going to be in failure or not. It, the fracture may displace. So you must know what is a cost index. So it is a ratio of the sagittal to coronal width with from the inside edges of the cast. So this is the lateral view. This is the AP diameter, AP distance, and this is the AP view, and this is the, AP, this is the AP view. So what is cost index? It is A oblique B. So this is known as cost index. So the cross section at of an appropriate forearm plaster should resemble an oval cast and not a circle. And for optimum cast fitting in the distal forearm fracture treated, the sagittal to coronal ratio should be 0 0.7, not more. If it is more, it means it is round. And it is different for different parts of the extremity. For example, in a you know, lower leg, it is around 1.2 because their AP diameter is more. So the well filling plasters are important with any immobilized extremity. So this is a oval type of the cast for fracture, both one forearm. It should not look round. So this is the importance of cast index. Coming to uh, three point fixation, Again, another important concept. Now, three-point contact and stabilization is necessary to maintain most close reductions. So there are three forces, one, two, and three. Whenever there is a fracture, especially in uh, forearm, distal forearm fractures, this is a concave side and this is a convex side. And the soft tissues, they break on the convex side and they are hinged on the concave side. So when we reduce the fracture with these three type of the forces or the molding, the soft tissues on the concave side is brought under tension. So it, it holds the fracture in place and does not allow the displacement of the fracture. But if any of the force is removed, then it is going, there is going to be loss of reduction. So it is, like this, this is one force, second and third, we reduce it and then we hold it in this particular position or mold it in particular position so that reduction is no loss of reduction. So use of three point molding is important for unstable fractures. So it produces tension in the intact soft tissues, produces compression across the fracture side to immobilize the fracture. This principle is used in all immobilization techniques for the fractures. So it is said a straight cast will usually contain a crooked bone, but a curved cast will generally contain a well-aligned bone. So this is how, this is a curved cast, but it is a well-aligned bone. Now coming to last few slides. Now what is the aftercare after applying a plaster? So we have to counsel the patient on signs of neurovascular compromise like excessive pain, swelling, bluish or white discoloration of the digits. So we have to document it very clearly and tell the patient if he develops anything like that, they have to report immediately. Otherwise, we are going to land in trouble. So tell them verbally and also report in your OPD card or discharge slip, whatever. So this is very important thing. Reinforce all cracks and weak areas with more POP locally. Limb elevation reduces swelling, pain, and risk of too tight cast. Check if the POP is restricting the movement and ensure that all joints not immobilized by the cast have full range of motion. 
keep pop dry any areas of localized pain should be windowed as it may be developing pressure sore the patient should be reviewed in one or two weeks and actually should be done to reaffirm maintenance of reduction now there are some common casting errors poor choice of the cast type that is failure to immobilize a joint above and below the injury redundancy and bunching in a cast liner or padding already told you it is secondary to careless uneven application or extremity position repositioning after application with the resultant pressure point formation and skin breakdown especially in the cubital fossa and anterior ankle crease excessive tight padding or cast material application inadequate padding at the pressure points i already elaborated on this failure to extend the cast to an appropriate proximal and distal levels it means you apply too short a cast it does not serve any purpose you are going to lose the reduction poor molding techniques with the subsequent cast displacement on the loss of reduction so here three point maintenance is with three point maintenance is very important and acceptance of a suboptimal cast so in conclusion despite revolutionary advances in the management of injury especially those of musculoskeletal system pop still remains very useful in carefully selected awaiting the need for unnecessary surgery with its attendant risk thank you so uh, if we are going to have uh, questions are there any questions uh, or we are going to have at the end of the dr tinejas talk yeah hello hi hi hello 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 yes hearing yeah yes we can hear you yeah yeah please if there are any questions or we can yeah we can go ahead with the professor tinejas talk and then we take questions together i think that will be better i think we'll have dr tinejas talk and then we we'll okay. have the whole discussion together no problem okay. no problem. So, Dr. Taneja, can you share your screen? Yeah, I, I will start my talk. Just click once on the slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can see my slide. Yeah, just click once on the slide. Yes. Okay. Right. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Go ahead. You go ahead. Okay. um uh, we just now heard uh, a very basic and a fundamental aspect of the fracture treatment and that is how a fracture has to be treated by a plaster technique a technique which is totally being forgotten these days by our young orthopedic surgeon i have been in this profession of orthopedics since 1964 so you can say it is about 55 years that was a time when we were treating all the fractures by plaster majority of them except fracture neck femur and few other cases then we started doing few operations and then the eo people came and all cases were getting treated by the operation we all have seen the many disasters complication of an operative treatment and this has always let me to understand and think that what would be the best method of treating this patient what are you looking for in this patient if i have to treat a patient of a fracture case what i am looking for i want him to get back on his feet as early as possible get as good to function as possible should not get any gross deformity or any shortening and it should be a cost effective treatment if that is my objective now how i achieve this objective with i achieve it by putting a just a plaster or i do an operation or i find out a via media what i call as a middle path management of treating this patient now this is what is the cast bracing and this is what i am going to talk to you 
Now, what I'm going to talk to, what is my going to be the agenda? So I'm going to talk to you the background of this, how I got into interested in this uh, technique, what is the philosophy, what are the indication and contraindication, when and how to apply this, what are the different types of braces and materials, tips on technique, complication, results, advantages, and what is my conclusion. Let's go to the background of this whole thing. As I was telling you in 19, after having passed 1964 and having done the house job in general surgery and orthopedics, I started having the feel of the plaster. And 1966, when we joined the post-graduation, the only one thing that came up very quickly from the, uh, uh, from the mouth of our teacher about who was this Hugh and Thomas and his philosophy of treating the orthopedic condition whether the cold or the trauma was enforced, uninterrupted, and prolonged immobilization. That was the basic philosophy of you on thermal. And this is what we learned from the very beginning, and we started practicing as any student. In 1970, after having done my registrarship in All India Medical Institute, I came to Iran. And when I came to Indore, uh, uh, I was all the time wondering that is it really essential to apply a plaster, one joint above and one joint below? And that was something a young mind who was searching all the time. I just devised this small splint that you can see of a simple iris. And there was a patient who had a fracture of the radius ulna. And I just applied this splint, as you can see that using the uh, using this uh, adhesive plaster, giving a traction and counter traction technique, and using a cotton padding to correct the viscous. To my utter surprise, the fracture united. It encouraged me, and I applied the same principle of using this splint in few more cases of the forearm fracture, although they were uniting with some angulation and some restriction of movements. I'm talking of 19. 72, when the, even the operative technique was not very much developed. And that was the time when we had an indoor orthopedic association. And I was a, probably the youngest uh, chap in that group of seven orthopedic surgeons indoor. And I presented my these cases to that group of few senior people. To my dismay, one of the senior most orthopedic surgeons said, what is all this bullshit you are doing? It? There is no such technique like this thing. You cannot treat a fracture unless until you immobilize it, a joint above and joint below. Don't you bring such cases to the meeting. I was very much disheartened. But never, I totally forgot about this thing. So we all, if you go into the whole background, it was all the time in my mind that we looked into literature and it was quite evident that lot many people, thousands of years ago, the people were getting fractured. There must have been a method to treat this thing. People had been using a stake and mud, different types of green twigs. They had been using leaves around the limb to do the compression of the soft tissue. The Egyptian dynasty has been using it. The Hippocrates has been using it. Pare has been using a lot of Indian and Chinese bone setters are there who have been treating external splintage braces and fractures. So there was a method of treating this pressure. If the, it was so very important to immobilize a joint above and joint below to get an enforced, prolonged immobilization, then I was, was wondering that how people with these types of bamboo split, and look at this girl, I will show you that she had an fracture on both sides of the upper limb. How would the fracture will unite in animals? And look at this child who came to us walking in a fracture hip spica, and to our utter surprise, the fracture united in all these conditions. How did the fracture of the ribbon uh, unite? How did the fracture of the tabicle unite? And look at that girl who is now in a plaster doing a flexion and extension of the elbow. So this was a eye opener to me that one thing was there, that fracture do unite if they are properly stabilized and because the nature which unites, and it is not the plaster, the joint above and joint below, which is very essential. Now, so the question came, 
that it was basically a controversy between rest versus a motion. Whether we should be giving a prolonged rest or we should be allowing some type of a motion. So the action is life. This came from a very famous orthopedic surgeon whose name was Lucas Champagne. Lucas, Lucas Champagne was a contemporary to Hugh and Thomas. Lucas Champagne was working in France at the same time when Hugh and Thomas was working in Liverpool. As you all know, the England and France always had been fighting and their philosophy has been just opposite. What France will do, England will not do. What England will do, France will not do. And here the Lucas Champagne always said that the early ambulation and early weight bearing and knee in extension is a very important fundamental for the union of a fracture. So two words emerged, stabilization and immobilization. The two different things. You can immobilize a particular thing. It can be a rigid immobilization, as the AO people at one time described. And other is that you just stabilize it, the fracture, and allow some type of a micro motion. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, a lot of good work has been done on the role of the micro motion and on the vascularity. So this equation became very famous that the callus is directly proportional to the micro motion and the vascularity at the fracture side. Okay. Now, if I have a fracture, I am looking for a good callus at my fracture side and not I'm asking for any primary bone union as it was recommended by the AOP. E. A. Nicole who has been a very famous British orthopedic surgeon in a, one of his very uh, beautiful article in uh, COR, I think volume 153. Worth reading an article, he said, the normal method of the union in a cortical fracture is by circumferential callus. I would doubt the wisdom of any method of treatment which is achieved by a primary bone union by deliberately suppressing the role of the periosteum. So this was a time when a lot of AO people were coming up and this article is a very eye-opening article. We all know the work of Sir John Chanley, his beautiful work on the close treatment of the fracture with that uh, classic book, we all have read it. And what did John Chanley write? He was an excellent operator and he would recommend surgery as and when required. But he was very sure that contrary to the popular idea, the operative treatment of fracture is much simpler than the non-operative treatment. Now we all know that in an operative treatment, all what you have to do is to just open it up, get the two ends of the fracture, reduce them, put a nail or plate, whatever you make. Not a very distinct, just a surgical escape. Whereas a non-operative treatment is a perfect art and the art has to be developed. Everybody cannot, I can challenge, the, the younger generation of today cannot treat a fracture properly, non-operatively, because they have not learned that technique of treating these patients. So what is the philosophy of this doing in a personal cost basis? The When the whole this thing was becoming popular, and I must give a credit to for uh, popularizing this technique to Augusto Sarmiento. In 1976, I was attending an international conference in London, and there was a, a poster presentation. And at one place in 1900, I saw a poster presentation, which was about the cost basic, that no joint above and no joint below should be mobilized. I found it out who has written this thing. Name was Augusto Sarmiento. So now it gave me immense happiness. I said, look, here is a gentleman from America who is talking about the same thing, which I was doing it in 1972, and I gave it up. Then you know that the first book on the cast basing, which was uh, published, and uh, also was Augusto Sarmiento, Lata and Moody. I bought that book and went through that book carefully, read one by page by page, and learned many things about the, this technique of this thing. Now, the, we all know that how it works. It basically, it works on the principle of the soft tissue giving in a compressive and hydraulic forces 
which maintains the flexure in position. And outside there is a cast which keeps the muscles compressed and thereby the, uh, the flexure remains in its position and does not get displaced. This was the whole principle. And now what were the indication and contraindication of doing this type of uh, treatment? I have done a large number of cases I'll share with you. And I have found from my own experience, the ideal is a flexure shaft of humerus, flexure shaft of tibia, isolated flexure of ulna, and flexure of humerus in children. You can treat all these patients very well by a uh, functional cost basis. Look at this uh, patient. They all patients have been treated by me. Uh, by the functional cost basing, we we'll let I share with you this thing. And as I was doing this thing, I was working in a government medical college as a orthopedic surgeon. And you know those hospitals, the outdoor attendance is something about 200 to 300 patients, very poor persons coming, very complicated cases coming to you. Sometimes you didn't know how to treat these cases. And then I just devised my own method and using this cast bracing in conditions like compound fracture, in polio patient, in fracture disease, in post orthoplasty, bone gap in lower limb, and supplement to the internal fixation. I show you some example that how I found this method to be very effective in this patient, which was a very cost effective, and patient accepted it. And that is the place where in the government hospital. One can easily get a patient, you can do that patient. If something went wrong, you can just get out of this thing and uh, plan as a line of treatment. Now look at the, uh, I'm showing you some example. You will see on these slides, the date of these are all my axes. This is 1986. Now look at the patient who had an fracture of the shaft of the femur. He has been, a cane nail has been done and you can see the cane nail is extremely blue. Here is a pa another patient, table plateau fracture, just one screw was put. Another, you can see a fracture on the uh, femoral condyle, just one screw was put. Very inadequate fixation from the our standard of what we now do in internal fixation. There was a time when they were not neither a good implant nor a good uh, surgical instrumentation, but people were, were very energetic and they wanted to do some surgery in these patients. So now in these cases, if you just leave them as such, you don't expect them to get any good result, whether the fracture will unite or not unite. And under these circumstances, where the joint will become stiff or mobile. And in these cases, not having understood what to do, I just put them into cast bracing. And I say, you keep start moving your joints. Just don't remain like this. Start moving your joints. To my utter surprise, all these fractures united with excellent range of motion and no plaster disease. That is still further encouraged me. Now here is a patient who had in a polio and he had developed a fracture in the uh, upper part of the tibia, probably I don't remember that. And the poor chap used to be on the tricycle and earn something. Now we all know that if we, uh, give a plaster above, one joint above, and one joint below, what will happen? Whatever the power is in the extremity, say to the power was two or three, you know that with a prolonged immobilization, his power in the muscle will come down by one grade and he would be a further disabled. I didn't want this. I wanted his muscle to be continuing in functioning so that he doesn't lose any power. And I found this method to be very handy in my hand. Now here is a uh, gentleman, you can see that. This gentleman had an, uh, I think the fracture, I remember it's a very old uh, uh, fracture probably shaft of the femur, and in which case a probably the intermolly nail, K nail was done. And the patient after this thing is starting pouring pus. That was the time when the sterility in the operation center was not very good. So very often patient will get infected. So this patient also got infected and he started pouring pus from this thing. I didn't know what to do about and whether to take out a nail or this thing. I just stuck my idea. I put in a medical catheter into this thing, put in a knee cast place. And um, I asked the patient to stand up with the help of crutches. 
start walking and you can see that that is how a Malakot catheter and a negative section bellow has been put. So it was all the time sucking the, all the pus which was inside. At the same time, patient started walking, weight bearing was permitted, micro motion was permitted, motion at the knee was preserved, and to my greatest utter surprise, the infection got control and the fracture went on united. Now this is another patient who had an um, injury to the, uh, the humerus, and he was put into a, because the lower ones are, was put into the elbow brace, and patient was encouraged to start moving the joint. I showed you this thing. This is the same patient. This is the, another patient. And this is how then I started treating patient who will get an infective, use a Malakors catheter, start mobilizing the joint. Because when you do a mobilization of the joint, it is the action of the muscle. And it is the action of the muscle which brings more blood. With that, you get in a more immune uh, immunity there, you get the lot of cells, you get a lot of oxygen, and the infection gets controlled. Now, they are, not that all the patients are fit for uh, any technique. For, for example, now if you have a patient who has gotten a peripheral neuropathy, anesthetic plate, a patient who has got a diabetic, a patient who has an, just an isolated radius fracture, or a Montagia fracture dislocation, a patient who has spastic, and intra-articular fracture and a mentally retarded patient are not a, a patient to be treated with an cast bracing. So question then came, the when and how to apply this cast brace? The correct answer was, the best time to apply a cast brace is when you have developed an intrinsic stability. For example, you have a patient who has a fracture of the tibia comes to you, obviously, there is some swelling, there is some overriding, try to reduce the fracture, give it an POP slab, wait for 10 to 12 days time. When the swelling has subsided completely, and if you find that there is the there is slight stickiness at the fracture side, probably that is the time you should be thinking of applying a cast brace. Never apply a cast brace on day one. Now, how long? one should apply a cast brace. The usual period is six to eight weeks. And you can see on the X-ray, if you find that union progresses satisfactory, you can continue. But if you find the union progresses unsatisfactory, probably that is a case where you can plan to do a premister bone grafting or percutaneous bone grafting, whatever is the choice of a surgeon. The, the question comes, what type of braces material? When 1972 I started, I didn't know they were all everything was locally made and uh, whether there were any braces, commercial braces were not at all available in the market. And I would usually most of these things. Then it was the Alimco, you know, the Alimco is the Artificial Limb Manufacturing Corporation of India, of the Ministry of Social Justice. Um, they, they started making these cast braces. Now, interesting thing was that uh, uh, we had an artificial limb center in our, uh, in our hospital in 1980 when I came on the transfer from uh, Manipur, Nagaland and joined my department. I was taking the round of my uh, artificial limb center. And uh, one of the my um, gentlemen in that center, sir, what is these uh, things like? We don't understand. Oh, I said, these are nothing but the functional cast braces. So they were available in my uh, artificial limb center and I very extensively started using. We started using the joints which were being used for different types of caliper. You can see the photograph lower down. It has been made by the uh, local man, which has hardly costed us about 20, 30, 40 rupees at that time. So we started using all types of uh, braces. We similarly, we started using the different types of polyvinyl, polypropylene, or different types of other material with our artificial limb center we're using for immobilizing the fracture. You can see that for the humerus, or you can see that for the fracture, lower end of the radius. And, but on the photograph on the top, you will see that there are, there are braces which are available, made available by the Alimco. And there is a special jig is also supplied that Alimco people 
for applying these basics. So then you can see that I, when I was very over-enthusiastic about this thing, I started using uh, this for the fracture of the proximal part of the um, uh, femur. I started using it for the, anywhere I felt like I started using it. The photograph on the right side is a friend of mine who was in America. He, he said, you are very much interested in uh, this. Yes. He said, I brought a gift for you. So this is what you are seeing is a, a functional brace, which he brought it to me from America. You can see that. And you can see the braces on the right side, lower down. And these are the braces of, made of the plastic material, which were also made available by the Alenco. But I had a not a good experience by these braces because they will very soon start breaking. So I thought the best would be to use the uh, aluminum one made by the Alenco people. As you are seeing, the uh, the third brace from the top is the, uh, the knee brace made be provided by from the Alenco people. Then you can see that uh, this is a, a prefabricated braces, which are I have taken this photograph from the Sarimento book, which uh, they had the uh, polypropylene or polyvinyl type of this thing, and will just they have ready-made prefabricated, and if there is a fracture, they'll put these braces. Uh, patient can wear the shoes and can start walking and uh, uh, become mobile. So the uh, uh, we all know that uh, uh, this uh, uh, PTB uh, uh, artificial limb. Uh, and from there, where the Sarmento got the idea of uh, doing a PTB plastering. So basically, it is the uh, which can be of a thermal plastic material, or you can make it of the uh, the plaster this thing and uh, the PTB plaster. When I was the president of Indian Orthopedic Association, then in 2000, the president had the privilege of inviting his one of his guests. So I went to American Academy meeting and uh, I attended a session which was being on the cast basing by Augusto Sarmiento. Looney and uh, Lata was also there. And in that hall, there were 12 people and I was the 13th people sitting there because usually the hall of the total hip, total knee will get packed. But this was a hall, there were 12 or 13 people. Now, after when this, uh, the seminar was over, symposium was over, in the question answer session, so I raised my hand and I said, Sir, I'm so and so, and uh, I do your lot of cost tracing. And by that time, I think I had done about three, 4,000 cases. So when I told him, he was aghast. He said, Look, look, don't go, you wait, I want to talk to you. So that is how I came in contact with Augusto Sarmiento. And I invited him to sir, kindly come to Jaipur, my conference, and the president of Indian Organization. And, and when he came to Jaipur, you should have seen those who attended this meeting. The hall was packed. People are standing all around to listen to him. And I asked him to demonstrate. Sir, kindly, can you demonstrate a PTB plaster technique? He said, okay, I'll do that. And this is what he's doing in a Jaipur. I'm excited. This was the very... Uh, emotional moment for me because here was my role model and whom, whom I learned many things from his book. Now, if you just go into the, uh, uh, look into different literature and the result of a short leg cast or a PTB plaster, there's not much of the difference in the overall results, uh, whether you do a PTB plaster or short leg plaster, the, the factor do unite, but there's always a problem of a malunion that was a big problem. Now, the, uh, this I'm just trying to show you, that was the time, and I had been holding about, uh, I held about two, three national level uh, workshop on the caste placing at Indore, at Riva, at in some other places. And this is a place where I was trying to demonstrate that how a, the trochanteric fractures can also be treated by applying a hip uh, a brace. This is what a technique which I am trying to demonstrate it. This is how what I said you can apply a what we call as a thigh sleeve. All these devices I just developed it. Now this is a how a thigh sleeve is applied different. Now the, the 
photograph that you're seeing on the extreme right here is where the, the most important place where the knee bracing causes that is the fracture around the knee joint. They are very ideal places to treat this thing. And this is where you use a different a specialized type of a bracing that how where exactly the brace has to be put, which must correspond with the center of the rotation of a joint. Because a small error can give rise to little mass union and other problems. And this is what I've been doing it and I've been doing it for I've been doing a lot of cases for the uh, elbow cast bracing. The, again, you know that the where center of rotation in the knee is slightly posteriorly and center of rotation in the elbow is slightly anterior. And this is how we're using a cast brace and uh, protecting the bony prominences with the soft roll, you one could apply the elbow cast brace as you can see uh, on the right side, which has been applied. And you can see it is 1984. Now we are running 2000, um, 2020. So that means it is almost 36 years old, my this thing. And this is a what we I used to call it as a olecrano condylar brace. Now this type of uh, is a very good thing for a isolated fracture of the ulna and where you have a free wrist joint and then a free elbow joint. And the uh, you apply this thing, a start motion as early as possible, and you all have treated fracture ulna, isolated fracture ulna, you'll find it's notorious for going into a non-junior, isolated ulna. You treat it within a cast bracing, I can tell you that in 90% of the cases, you will be met with a success. No technique is free of complication. If you say that um, I don't get complication, I, I have, uh, you can see that you, I used to get swelling, breakage of the braces, loosening, breaking of the POP, delayed union, non-union, all, all type of problems you will really start getting. So you can see that how the cast brace, it will give rise to a swelling, the brace will break, you can see all those things. Sometimes it will become absolutely loose, sometimes. Uh, so all different types of complications we started coming to us. And you can see that the uh, brace has become loose. Some people will get the brace out, repair it themselves. Somebody will just bring the other portion in their head. Very interesting things. And these all things started coming to us and we started this thing. You can see how much of the, the swelling sometimes the patient, uh, this thing. Is not, it was not possible for me to apply all the braces myself. And sometimes my youngster will apply and that will give rise to a typical complication which Rajesh was showing that by applying a tight plaster, you can get all sort of blisters and everything. So these all things do happen when you apply, do a little wrong technique. Now here are the patient who got in a, a mal union in our tree by, treated by the uh, cast brace. So we all used to get this type of complications, sometimes they'll go into non-union also, but very rare. Now, uh, in a, one of the series of uh, Sarmiento, he had only 1% of non-union in about 5,000 cases, which is a very remarkable finding. And we also find that if you are uh, applied the cast base at a right time, in a right way, and you have followed it up perfectly well, I don't think you are likely to get a non-union. So, uh, in last, uh, this is my old slide, but now it is more than, I've been this professor for more than 50 years. The number has gone much above the 4,000 cases. And most of the cases I treat is a tibial fracture and the humeral shaft of the fracture and radius and isolated fractures are few and sometimes fracture few. So these are the patients we have this thing. And if we looked into the, our result, that the union time has been very comparable, usually 12 to 14 weeks or slight ambulation in about 10% of the patient, shortening of about less than one centimeter, non-union in about 2% of the cases. So the results are very uh, encouraging, especially up in our population who has been mostly from the rural area, has been a very poor uh, people. And in a very, very low cost, I could treat thousands of these patients to my utmost happiness and utmost satisfaction. That is what is important. You see, you must try to understand 
that anatomical reduction and acceptable reduction are two different things. The, in the Western world, the, well, they will not ac uh, accept even a five degrees of ambulation. They will not accept even a um, half a centimeter of shortening, and they will sue the doctor. Therefore, they have their own compulsion of doing this patient and operating them, where they have a very high standard of uh, sterility, very good instrumentation, very good implant. Thanks to uh, uh, the growth, and development in our country. Now we have also got the best of the theater, best of the instrumentation, best of the implants. The things have started changing. So these are some of the patients treated by me. You can see that how beautiful the callus is formed. You see, if you get in a fracture, what you are looking for in a fracture, and I will uh, tell you one very interesting story. And uh, you can see these all patients where the immobilization was not very adequate. What do you do that? Either you remove an implant or what you do then. I just would put them into cast plate and you can allow the patient to motion. The fracture would unite. Patient would be very happy. He can go back. Now, these are some of the examples. All these patients have been uh, treated by me. You can see the fracture lower down. And this case was put into the, um, uh, as a short case in one of the examination. And many people diagnose it as a case of a tumor, lower end of tibia. But this was basically nothing but an exuberant good callus formation in a fracture in the lower one third of the tibia. So I remember that in one of the uh, British Orthopedic Association meeting, which was being held in Newcastle upon Tyne in UK, and when there was a time that people were talking of the primary bone union and primary bone union, and uh, one South uh, uh, African orthopedic surgeon talked about this. One gentleman got up from the back seat and he said, I have a question to you. He said, well, gentlemen, you are talking about the callus as if it is a malignant tissue of the bone. Do you know who was that gentleman? And there was a pin drop silence in the whole of the hall. And do you know who was that gentleman? He was Osman Clark, who was the assistant, first assistant to Sir uh, Watson Jones. So everybody was aghast that who is talking about this thing and how right he was that uh, a very rigid embolization is never the answer of this thing. These are some of the further uh, patients of our who had uh, developed an uh, excellent... Uh, so these are the patients and you can see uh, these patients have flexors have united. Sorry, I am going... Uh, Okay. Now you can see that uh, this shows the result patient with uh, using a car sprays or driving the scooter. They are, they can lift a heavy object. They are walking, moving in the uh, market. They are going back to the offices. What else do you want? You can see this. This gentleman, I still remember, is now no more. He was a, a taxi driver and he developed a, a compound fracture of a lower one-third of a community compound fracture, lower one-third of a tibia. And uh, he was in the, I just in the evening went to the hospital and he was being wheeled into the operation center. I said, what is this patient? He says, sir, we are going to do an, a baloney amputation. I said, for what? He says, sir, he's uh, very bad and I don't think we can save the limb. I just uh, have tried to feel the dorsal speed is. It was palpable, I said, just wash the wood, give it a slab, and I'll see what we can do from tomorrow. You won't believe this patient survived his limb, and if I would have the x-ray to show you, you even cannot make out that there was a fracture in that tibia. So beautiful modeling took place, he went back to his work. So this was, he started walking very soon, and he went back to his profession of driving a, a taxi. Now this gentleman who had an, a, bilateral problem in the tibia and who was given uh, this ankle brace. And one day I found him in the market uh, in a rainy season walking. I just took a photograph and I, he was so happy. He said, I'm very happy and I'm now moving around it. So this is what I'm trying to say. This is the patient. When I used to try to treat the trochantic fracture, they will come to my clinic. I take record their motion and this thing. And these are the type of it. Sometimes very bad cases, compound fractures treated by the uh, simple cost-basing method and achieved a very satisfactory result. 
you can see all these patients that how they started moving their joints and as soon as the place were removed there was increase in the motion by about uh, 50 to 20 percent so the, that was the the most important thing which i found of uh, using this method was that they continuously kept moving their joints the muscles were in action circulation was good oxygen supply was good and that is what the matter there was no plaster disease at all now this was a he was a one uh, journalist who had a fracture of the lower one third of the tibia and you can see that how beautifully the fracture are united and uh, the many you know i've treated uh, many uh, doctors and uh, many other people with the cast facing who are advised surgery in those patients so what i said that the economics of a patient in our country you must not forget that even today in india about 70 percent of our population is living in rural area they they are interested just their factor should unite at a very low cost that's very important now if you think of a this is my old slide if you think of the operative treatment of any condition this is nothing less than 40 to 50 thousand rupees and how much it costs in the cost facing maximum of 5,000 rupees, you can do any type of cost basic. So what I'd say is that there are many, many advantages of using a cost basic, which I call it as a middle path uh, method of treating this patient, who by your method, you can make the patient stand, make the patient walk as early as possible, you can send him back to his work, his offices, his shopping, and you will get the very early mobilization of the joint and minimal morbidity and disability and free from complication of operation. The, which I always, even today, I'm seeing so many patients where they could have been treated by a simple cast basic treatment, the interlocking nails have been done and they are coming within a non-union because there is a gap at the fracture site or the patient coming with a pulling pus infection. Still, this is there. So you are converting the closed fracture into an open fracture. This was a very old dictum which was taught to us. And people said, you see, if you ask many of the people still, they will still not know what is their, uh, uh, the surgical site infection incident in their hospital. So it's, it's very difficult to even in today's sterility, when so good to have an international standard of about uh, less than 1% or uh, between uh, up to 1% to 2% infection rate very difficult and it causes reduced hospital stay that's important so i always say that the cost pricing is a very ideal middle path regime of treating this fracture it is of great utility in a very unusual circumstance you don't know what should i do in this case i said don't forget about it put it into cost place they start telling him to not. because once they have got a cost place it acts as a psychological stabilizer and it's very easy to apply one has to see one any person and demonstrate demonstration and you can start applying this thing very well. It has a very minimum complication. It gives you very excellent result. It's a very low cost. It is an appropriate technology. What you need in your country, it should be an appropriate technology that's very important. It is very easily available. There is no question. In Jaipur, when uh, I was sitting um, with uh, Augusto Sarmiento, I just, uh, after his lecture, I asked him, sir, what is your uh, opinion overall treatment of cost basing? And that is what he said. The Sarmiento method of cost basing is a very effective for treating the fractures in the developing countries and even in the developed countries, especially for the fracture of the shaft of the humerus and fracture of the tibial fracture. It is a very relevant method. And these words are coming from Augusto Sarmiento. And people say, sir, do you still use F FCB? I say, yes, I do a lot of FCB still. And these are some my, I you show, I showed you the cases of 84 or 86. But here, I understand this is 2013 case. You can see that there's an ankle brace has been applied. You can see that there's another patient, 2016 case, where I've applied it, uh, uh, the uh, bracing in this patient. 2018 cases, this is, has been treated by cost pricing. This is another 2018 case has been treated by cost pricing. And therefore, I say that uh, wherever possible, 
And if I can treat a patient within a cost placing, I would never hesitate to do so and offer him to do this thing. The, the third book which came out from the Augusto Sarmiento and, and Lauren Lata is the non-surgical treatment of fracture. And those who are listening to me, if they have not read this book, I will very strongly recommend them to be reading this book. And with these words, you can see this other patient of uh, cast basing, which has been done recently in 2018. You can see that the ankle brace has been applied. These are the patients. Where they have been all, you can see how beautifully the fractures have united by using your this method. These are all very recently uh, treated in last one or two years patient of the cast basing right? With these words, I thanks the organizer for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. My experiences of last 40, 45 years on cast basing. Thank you. Any question? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for covering it very comprehensively. Now we are open to questions. So, Dr. Abdul Ghani, do you want to start? Yeah, I can actually. Uh, to start with, just a comment actually rather than question because I think sir has beautifully covered this art, which is obviously not very easy to practice, unfortunately, especially these days. And because especially the uh, we are not being taught that regularly, and hence gradually this art is becoming less and less common. However, having said that, I mean, the world has become uh, come to a full circle again anyways. Uh, current corona situation, we don't know how long it's going to go. But at least the present condition, circumstances, the aerosol generating and all, I think uh, your method of treatment may be well applied and start uh, practicing more commonly, frequently. Who knows? Because the COVID, we don't know whether it's going to stay here or go. That, that's, that's a debate, actually. Another comment is, um, it is it can be a good bailout option even in the non-COVID period as well. Because there are situations at times you cannot operate or reoperate, especially because of infection or other stuff. So this is, can be a very good bailout option as long as it is done in a particular way. However, it is cannot be taken as a panacea for all the patients. It has to be in a very select group, even in the poor patient also. There was an issue about the cost. But to me, I think because patient going, coming back from the periphery and all, at times the cost matches. And these days, even the poorest of the poor want the best results. And especially the poor would rather need better limbs, uh, all the more because he had to work better or harder and he cannot afford another surgery and revision or correction, so to say. But more smooth patterning, as it already told, it is uh, actually not, it is not that easy to apply and not too easy to practice by anyone. Obviously, Dr. Teneja is very well experienced and he's master. And that is the reason he has shown these results. Everybody and all person, people, perhaps they are not going to reduce these results. So that is a word of caution because we have to be careful when to use. We need to know though, basically that this method exists as a bailout option. Thank you. I think that's the comment. Thanks. Uh, any other question or comments? Rajesh, you did not uh, mention on the method to remove the uh, these uh, synthetic uh, uh, plasters. Sir, uh, that is uh, basically another talk, you know, how to remove the plaster cast. Right. Uh, so this is how to remove a plaster cast. Uh, it takes 10 minutes, you know, for the... So I have not uh, yeah, covered the... Dr. Rajesh, I have a few comments to make. Uh, no problem, yeah. I have a few comments to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carry on. Yeah. Uh, one thing now is the patients are very concerned about the weight of the plaster that they're put into. Yes. So the one small tip is to like, if you have to put a slab, it's a six inch slab. We can just fold it and make it a three inch slab. So this is the thing I've been practicing, which reduces the weight of the plaster by half. So like we can apply, apply a bubble book POP maybe with just two plaster bandages of six inches. No. So that's one tip. Yeah, uh, Sanjeev, can I? So you can you can even apply you know, slab with a synthetic cost, you know? That is even lighter. Yes, but then the cost is also an issue. 
the issue is the cost as well oh yeah that is there that is there and yeah the other thing is uh, one thing is the plasters uh, being misused in the sense that even the light uh, fiber pop is advised by some of our colleagues for manipulations which i think should not be done in my opinion we should use the pop bandages for manipulation i don't know what see, dr just see, see 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 one thing is very clear for reducing a fracture and holding it initially it is pop not synthetic cast but it should go people, no maybe maybe people are using it but it is it is less moldable you know this is this yeah. synthetic cast is less moldable and you cannot hold the reduction so if you ever want to apply synthetic cast you can apply a layer after you have done the reduction yes that that's what i want to say yeah and you can apply a layer after you have done the reduction then you can apply one 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 layer over that that then right. it will not break easy you know the people are concerned concerned about breakage of the cast right and the last comment is i think this is an art which needs to be revisited and we need to being in the medical college i think we need to uh, you know post our residents in the plaster rooms and let them put the plasters rather than you know plaster boys putting the plasters and uh, this technique especially you see the young surgeons they just want to stay to go and operate rather than try even plasters so especially as dr ghani rightly said in the present corona times and obviously in the future as well i think we have to we should shift more of our practice towards non operative and conservative treatment of fractures in the form of plasters see sanjeev the message is whatever fractures we can treat by conservative method we should treat we should treat yes there absolutely. are there are indications where we have to operate so we should operate no problem but whatever the fractures you can treat by conservative method you should treat second second i think we all have learned this plaster technique from our plaster technicians nobody taught us and nobody is going to teach anybody you know so that that is the issue but the boys should you know apply more and more plaster no we should be there on the forefront to teach them how to apply properly this is our responsibility also as a teacher to tell them this is the proper way to apply Absolutely. we cannot send them send the boy to the plaster room and okay lagao plaster lagao bachcha lagao kaise lagayega wo he doesn't know how to apply because we have to teach them then, it is then, not i know i know it is not in the curriculum you know it is not in in given uh, in detail in our textbooks but then we as teachers have the duty to teach them and tell them this is the proper way absolutely rajesh you would be surprised to know that uh, how the technique is abused i have seen senior orthopedic surgeon applying ponsetti plaster for club foot with a synthetic plaster which is cannot absolutely be. contraindication absolutely cannot contraindication be. you cannot do a manipulation with an synthetic plaster that's very very important and um, sanjeev put up a very good uh, comments um, ashok you have something to say yeah sanjay yeah sanjeev. i i have i have a lot in fact this is a very extensive topic can you hear me yeah yes yeah can you this is a very extensive topic not being touched these days uh one i belong to a generation which has seen best of the both of the world i have seen people like taneja doing wonders with plasters and braces i have worked in a department in jammu where we used to do most of the fractures with plaster and now i am in a city mumbai where everything is done with surgeries with latest equipment latest so i am witness to the best of the both worlds so what uh, now i want to ask rajesh like take wedging i mean how do we decide a wedge can it be taught to our younger generation because we are all worried about peer pressure somebody else is doing fixation very nicely what should i do although there is an indication for conservative treatment uh, we are worried about the medical legal aspects which is a big sword always so whether a mal union should be excised dr taneja said that it is very common in west bengal so i think this is the time covid time is a time when we should all audit all this now i am sure lots of fractures will be treated conservatively so maybe we should uh, sort of audit them and then present papers in different uh, journals in next 6 months or 1 year i am sure this is going on for next 1 year so we should audit all these cases which we have treated for uh, conservatively in next 6 months or last 3 months 
So I think we can get good uh, literature for and renew the whole interest in this. So uh, I wanted to know about wedging and all that. So how do you decide a wedge and so, uh, listeners? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So wedging has to be done at the site of the deformity, you know. And wedging is indicated for angulated fractures, not for the displacements, you know. Yeah. And wedging has to be there. You have to mark the, you know, where your proper wedge is going to be. And then you have to decide how much to cut, how much cost you have to cut. You cannot cut one third. You cannot cut two third, in, uh, you know, one and a half. So you have to cut two thirds. So you are able to break it. You have to break that. And the hinge posteriorly or on one side will remain. So that does, does not break completely. So once you have done that, then you have to see, you know, uh, select a appropriate size, you know, uh, some wooden piece or something like that, you know, or cut you like that. Now, how much, you know, it is eyeballing, how much, you know, you have to insert there. Now, but it should not impinge on the underlying skin. You have to keep it in the outer, you know, 50% of the plaster, you know, width. You cannot go inside. Otherwise, it will impinge on the skin and lead to pressure source. Now, once you open it up, then you have to maintain it there and then you have to repair it with a fresh plaster cast. And after that, you have to get a check x-ray done. So if you don't get a check x-ray, then it is, you know, no use. So these are the few points. If you allow, uh, if you allow me, I will want to show one case. Basically, I want to ask Dr. Tanija, like, yes, sir. Sir, one of the commonest thought of fractures where we can treat it non-operatively, although everybody operates on numerous, but it is supposed to be the non-union rate is very low. I want to show one uh, series and then uh, ask, uh, discuss Dr. Tanija about the, can we still treat humerus with a car? How, what is his method? Suppose he recommends that even I want to try that. Like there are so many conservative treatments also for humerus shaft fractures. Like some say you cast, some say you slab, some say hanging cast. So what would be the dictum? What is your guideline or algorithm? So which fraction? I'll first show you the x-ray. Just if there are viewers there who can see that what can go wrong with a humorous fixation. I, I'll try to share screen. Uh, sir. Sanjay, all sir, sir. The fracture in the... Sir, I'll show you the x-ray Sir, sir let, let him show the x-ray. Okay. Sir, your first x-ray, please. Can you see now? Sir, uh, uh, yeah. No, no, sir. This is not the first one, sir. Yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Can you see this? This is So this is a very common humerus shaft fracture. We always think that there might be nerve impinge, muscle impinge. But uh, so we go ahead and do fixation. So I'll just show you. So this is a fixation. Of course, a very poor fixation. You have three screws above, three screws below. Although there's a uh, I I don't know whether... Uh, closed technique was tried, but I think it's an open thing. So there's a lot of gap maintained. So practically you have achieved almost nothing. You are probably achieving that you have maintained the gap, which probably would have with muscle action as Dr. Kanija told us with a cast brace or a cast, it could have probably muscle sur surrounding soft tissues would have compressed it, given a better alignment, and it would have united. So it ultimately ends up in uh, non union so I am showing the other other end. Here you can see not a very straight anatomical reduction, but then you can see good uh, callus formation. And so treated with a hanging cast, so done well. So now that is the question I wanted to ask. I will stop this. Or if you want to, Sanjay. It. Yes, sir. Now uh, the question to Taneja, sir. How, how do you see humerus fractures as of now in present age? How can yeah. we treat them and what is the algorithm you would suggest? Yeah, I will, I will tell you. Uh, Sanjay, they're coming to your uh, the fracture shaft of the humerus. 80 to 85 percent of the cases can be very well treated with your functional cast bracing. Now, these patients, when they come to you, if you find they have a little swelling, you can just give them a use slab, wait for a couple of days, and then you can apply them into a, what we call as the functional sleeve or which is of made up of the plaster of Paris. Those, if you can have a, somebody to make a, a polypropylene or a thermoplastic material, 
you can apply that and you can start mobilizing the elbow joint and the shoulder joint and you will find the in a, within about 10 to 15 days time to your great satisfaction you will find the some degree of callus formation there might be some little angulation which which should not worry you on that account so you can easily treat the most important thing is to make sure that you have a bone contact which is very important for the factor union that make sure that there was crepitus when you were applying the this thing because the biggest mistake which is done is that probably if there is some interposition then you will say i applied the correct method and it did not unite okay the fractures which are in the lower one third they can be very well be treated either by the hanging cast method or you can treat them by the elbow cast brace in that case simply applying the functional sleeve or a thermoplastic material sleeve will not be functioning so you will have to get it into either an elbow cast bracing or you will have to apply the hanging cast brace the uh, x-ray that you showed uh, uh, sanjay about the yeah. uh, gentleman who had the fracture humerus uh, in which the plating was done well it was uh, technically wrong there was a gap you don't expect such an fracture to unite by the put just put, help, put if you would have left it to the cast bracing yeah. the fracture would have easily united in about uh, five to six weeks time now such an a patient i don't know what had happened and how it was uh, treated now what i do in this patient if you tell them that i'm going to remove your plate yeah. i'm going to do a cast brace they will not agree because they have spent 40 50 thousand rupees on getting the plating done in such few cases what i have done i put them into a functional sleeve and i try to put an percutaneous bone grafting through in into that area in not in majority but in few cases they may be lucky that they may get an callus formation otherwise the best would be to get the plate removed put them into a cast brace or you do the re-surgery and you will find the fracture if you look into the uh, rockwood book even they have written this thing that majority of the humerus fracture must be treated conservatively never be in a hurry to this thing you get in a patient these days all my youngsters Sir, इधर क्या करने का है इधर अपने को नेल डालने का है इधर लॉक नेल करने का यू नो दिस यंगर जनरेशन हैज बीन ब्रॉट अप दैट वे दे हैव नो कॉन्फिडेंस दैट दे कैन ट्रीट द फ्रैक्चर यू सी यू शुड हैव दैट कॉन्फिडेंस ऑफ ट्रीटिंग द फ्रैक्चर ह्यूमर दैट कम्स बाय द एक्सपीरियंस ओवर द इयर्स दैट वी हैव स्पेंड ट्रीटिंग दिस फ्रैक्चर सो व्हाट व्हाट टू समराइज दिस यू आर सजेस्टिंग दैट यू शुड गिव अ यू स्लैब फॉर ऑलमोस्ट 3 वीक्स नो 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 यू स्लैब फॉर 3 वीक्स नॉट एट ऑल you have to you have to just when the patient comes and you have find the swelling there just apply it for about 3 to 4 days then you find the swelling will go and, and then convert it into a cast brace you can either apply a thermoplastic this thing it is a gravity and it's, it is a muscle say this thing the hydrostatic pressure will come it will keep the your uh, fracture in position you are allowing the motion the fracture callus formation will be there effective will unite only thing is this they why people are not doing it i've talked to many people they have no confidence on that yeah. and they say ki sir pata nahi judega nahi judega uh, angulation ho jayega patient kya bolega wo x-ray de ke ghumta rehta hai they don't have confidence and this comes only when you have treated hundreds of such patient you know this type of fracture i have united and this was also united thank you sir okay. uh, one Dr. question sir. Uh, dr rajesh can we combine uh, both type of plaster like what i'm trying to say what i do generally is for example hip spica with a normal plaster pop and the top layer with a synthetic cast and so is the case when even i'm manipulating a fresh fracture both on leg or forearm just supplementing on the top with the synthetic cast idea is a it becomes lighter b it becomes stronger c it avoids uh, uh, cracking or breaking of the plaster at the junction particularly the joint uh, absolutely yes absolutely yes as I already you know uh, uh, i responded to jeeb's question also absolutely yes you know it becomes light you can apply a layer over that over the pop no problem but the again important tip here is don't apply it immediately okay. why so why so wait for few minutes wait the plaster to set a bit then apply reason being the the, the dissipation of the heat decreases from the plaster of paris Mm-hmm. so there are going to be the chances of burn you know so when you apply plaster cast wait for a few minutes and then apply the synthetic bandage 
Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Gani, you go ahead with your case if there is no question. Okay. We have a few minutes left. Yeah. You have to share the screen. Is I am sharing. Uh, can, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah, your case is there already. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I've got a case. Uh, he, she is a young, uh, like fifty years old female does not have any comorbidities she had a fall from stair essentially it was a twisting injury we're talking of fresh injury it's a close there is a minimal swelling but not tense swelling no blisters no deficit and no tenderness in proximal leg so what are the options can i start with the i think i start with the dr sanjay because obviously yeah, this is Hello. a uh, long oblique fracture of distal yeah. one-third. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, if you really want to, present days, you can think of uh, metaphysical plate, fixation of the fibril lateral malleolus, getting the lateral pillar in position. Okay. But uh, now that we are discussing non-operative treatment. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously you can be unbiased actually. I, 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 I would, because uh, as I told you, I have been in the best of both worlds. Yeah. I, have, I can still try reduction, close reduction, give a, um, uh, if not immediately, you can give an above knee cast for at least two to three weeks and then convert yeah. it into a PTB at around three weeks. Probably Dr. Taneja can modify it. So but I think it should do well. It's a long oblique spiral fracture, so they should unite well. So you, you got both options. I mean, depends also upon the patient choice as well. Perhaps you're going to, for example, patient says that mm -hmm. I don't want. If you talk now, COVID times, yes, definitely I will conserve. No, no, COVID, I'm not, I'm talking non-COVID time. We're not taking COVID into consideration for this, obviously. Yeah, um, or maybe an older patient, an old patient, maybe with some morbidities, definitely no, can no be conserved morbidity. and with good results. 50 years old, she's quite healthy otherwise. She's up and about, physiologically around 45 only. It is conservable, as I told you, with the whatever I told you that okay. you can give right. a cast for two weeks, then convert Dr. it to Rajesh, PTB. Dr. Rajesh? Definitely be conservative, always. Okay, obviously we are discussing. Dr. Sanjeev? I would go conservative, but if the patient insists and if, uh, you know, we don't go, want to go for a plaster, maybe an expert TV nail. Okay, sounds good. Obviously, I'm not going to ask Dr. Taneja because that is conservative. I know the answer. Yeah. And uh, again, again to Dr. Sanjay, again, if you want yeah. to operate, nail or plate? I would go I for expert. I will do a minimally invasive plate from the plate. medial side and get a... Uh, I, would go for an, I would go for a nail and make the patient walk. Right. Okay. What about lateral mellus? We've got fibula, lateral mellus also that broken. That that looks quite all right. I mean, maybe if we're not sure operatively that it's not stable, maybe we can put a couple of wires or maybe we just leave it as such and uh, uh, weight bearing is delayed for three weeks. Okay, Dr. If we Rajesh, don't fix it, then three weeks weight bearing delayed. Dr. Rajesh, you're going to go for plate or nail? Operative. Plate. Definitely MIPO. MIPO. Fix the fibula or no fibula fixation? If I'm going for a MIPO, I will fix the fibula. Okay, oh, good. Right. So, because obviously we are discussing this topic, so obviously I decided to go with the conservative only. She was given long leg cast, universal precaution, non-weight bearing, and that was check x-ray immediately after the plaster. Any comments? Uh, Sounds good. Yeah, it is a good lateral malleolus is well restored. Your TBI is also acceptable in good reduction. Okay. Nice. So, it is a long oblique fracture, so I think union should not be a problem. Okay, so we continue with the same. We continue uh, with the same. Can I make a comment? Uh, yes, please. Uh, of course, uh, all these patients who are now coming, people are going putting in a nail or they want to put in a MIPO or a uh, metaphysical plate and trying to fix the lateral column also. But I tell you, I, in my lecture, if you might have noticed it, the last uh, four or five cases were all exactly like these type of the cases. They yeah. do extremely well yeah. to put them into an ankle cast brace. You see, 
all the fractures in the lower one third of the tibia are for, meant for the ankle cast basis. And you can make them walk after 24 to 48 hours. Fractures in the upper one third of the tibia are one which are ideal for the knee cast basis. And fracture in the shaft of the tibia are ideal for the PTB plastic. This is the fundamental thing. And I have treated in last two, three years about eight or ten such cases, and they all are done extremely well. And they all fracture unite very well. They start walking on a um, second, third day, very happy. In about six to eight weeks' time, the fracture united. They have got full range of knee movements, very good ankle movements. What else do you want without operation? So in about three, four, five thousand, he goes back home. There's no need to put in any plate, this, that, and all that plate is gone. But of course, it's in an individual chart. But this can be treated very well conservative. Very well conservative. Thank you. So she was followed up. Obviously, I mean, one message is for the listener. You cannot just leave it. You have to do X-ray at least for three weeks. Why yeah. three weeks important? Because three weeks either they displace. If they get do not displace in three weeks, the fracture becomes sticky. So that means, and you need to have a serial X-ray, maybe weekly or ten weeks, uh, or ten days each, twice at least two X-rays in first three weeks. If you're not, they're going to displace in three weeks. Perhaps they're not going to displace in three weeks. And moreover, even if you have to treat them operatively within three weeks, essentially they are treated as a fresh fracture. You do not have to go ahead with a uh, bigger surgical operation. Uh, this thing. So she remained in the same position. She had a long cast for eight weeks. And after that, that was converted and then started touch weight bearing. Essentially, x ray at the three months and then subsequently x ray four months after the removal of uh, POP. So, clinically, she was doing good. Range of motion were quite good and she was happy. And uh, uh, this was the x ray from the sep uh, September. And after that, I saw her, though I don't have any x ray, but she is doing extremely well. So, no issues clinically as well. Good. That's a good job done. Sure. Uh, sir, uh, Professor Dr. Teneja, uh, in uh, you know, ankle FCB, suppose this type of a patient is there, after how long should we apply FCB? You see, as soon as the swelling is over, you see, you get this, like, like let us take this patient who has a fracture of the lower one side of the tibia. Obviously, he must be having a swelling. So you just apply a blow knee slap to him, leave it for about four or five days or one week's time, you will find whole swelling, everything disappears completely. The right time to apply uh, uh, ankle FTP. No, then, sir, how? Then, when to start the weight bearing? After 48 hours, easily. Partial weight bearing. You can start bearing. No problem. Is there any I, chance I, of no? I, yeah. I put them onto weight bearing after 48 hours with the help of crutches or a walker and gradually then increase the weight bearing. And in, you'll find that within a two weeks time after the cast phase, they are bearing the full weight. No problem. Uh, even in oblique fractures? Yes, yes. They do it very well. You see, the basic principle of a cast bracing is this. When you apply the cast phase, you see, the why does an oblique fracture try to displace when you're putting in a weight bearing is because of the, the weight transmission. But here, because a lot of weight is taken by the cast brace, it uh, uh, surpasses and bypasses the fracture this way. And therefore, the weight transmission from the fracture side is almost about 35 to 40 percent. 60 percent weight will go through the cast brace upward. It bypasses this thing. So they don't tend to this thing. If at all, there may be a slight overriding, may be there, but that is that will not cause you any anxiety or any problem. Okay, that's not, not will cause any anxiety. Thank you. Can I go with the next case, please? Yeah. Yes. That's the last case, actually. Yeah, yeah, it has to be last. Okay. <laughs> that is the reason I told you. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I think I'm not going to ask Dr. Sanjeev, perhaps he knows about this case. So he is not in the picture. So could start with Dr. Rajesh. Do you know about this case, I think, as well? I so don't Dr. know. Dr. Sanjeev, Dr. again. So we got a 65 years old gentleman who had RTA, close injury, intact, distal neurovascular status, skin and soft tissue, okay, no comorbidities. So how to go about, sir, Dr. Sanjay? Yes. You know, this, this is a type of the case. Now, here you have a fracture in the junction of, uh, you can say, okay. mid one-third and upper one-third type of a, this thing. Now, here in the patient, you can apply always the, the knee brace or even the PTB. But the knee brace would be better. In these cases, you can easily treat this patient uh, conservatively. No problem. 
sorry to interrupt i fully agree with you but uh, except the people like you who are actually master in that i think 95% 97% people are perhaps not going to be uh, able no, to no, no. this patient. because no no I, otherwise, I, otherwise you can go and do an uh, interlocking of this patient and you can treat this patient they are all these patients in my hospital also all my youngsters they don't allow me to apply any conservative treatment this is some corporate karna hai yeah we also we also need to discuss a treatment which is reproducible yes, exactly Yes, it's not a one of a surgeon can treat so Correct. that cannot be a uh, treatment exactly exactly i fully yeah. agree but so all, op all options should be kept yeah. open yeah as dr taneja said that these are upper third middle third junction fractures so very notorious it may look very simple generally but once you start doing nailing from them they get displaced and then they have the gap maintained there's an anterior posterior displacement which is very difficult to maintain so what you can see the reduction in your lateral probably might be maintained like that so then you are always worried and this would unite so either you need an expert nail or you need to put a polar screw or you need to there are lots of things you can do while doing nailing so these are not simple fractures for na nailing on the other hand if you think of as dr taneja said you do close reduction and do a cast brace or even a ptb probably after two weeks might be very useful so even if you are able to maintain this position and i get get little bit of um, correction of the axis i think they can do well with the conservative treatment but it needs guts as these days we are all worried about peer pressure failure of the treatment Absolutely. and somebody needs to reinforce seniors yeah. like taneja sir need to be there to tell you that this will do well you to instill confidence in you but i think uh, people like me will be easily convinced to do close treatment conservative treatment for such people you going to do nailing sir or plating dr sanjay nailing or plating no i would still do nailing as i told you i would be ready with all the armor material you might need to do okay. polar okay. screw or may need need an expert nail because the herzog bend will come very close which will displace right. this uh, soon it will be coming to dr taneja anyway so i will show what we have I mean, done it was done in emergency mm -hmm. this was a x-ray of the whole leg mm -hmm. unfortunately mm -hmm. hello unfortunately mm -hmm. there was no cm available or resident sided let's go ahead give a shot and this is what happened unfortunately so essentially nail though it is done but unfortunately not fixed anything it is rather splitted the proximal fragment is totally unstable uh, obviously there is a varus as well so this is the situation on day yeah. three or two post up so what do we do from here that is a very uh, i think the shining example for youngsters because of the bend it can all split it up and even your reduction may fail so one thing very important to learn from this x-ray so what next नहीं अब तो चिड़िया चुग गई खेत अब तो बैठो नो बट इन तो अभी हमने बस ये यू हैव टू डू समथिंग डॉक्टर राजेश यू कम इन हिम प्लीज नाउ यू कैन स्टिल फॉलो दिस तनेजा सर स्टेटमेंट यू कैन गिव अ कास्ट ब्रेस ट्राई एंड वेट ए कास्ट ब्रेस इन दिस पोजीशन सर इन दिस विद दिस एक्स विद दिस नेल या नाउ यू टू कन्विंस पेशेंट टू गेट टेक इट आउट एंड ऑल दैट यू कैन गिव अ ट्रायल ऑफ स्टिल कास्ट ब्रेस आई थिंक विद लिटिल बिट ऑफ करेक्शन बिकॉज़ आई थिंक दिस नेल विल अलाउ यू सम करेक्शन as it is sitting probably you might get away okay professor taneja sir because revising this now is a disaster so you have a loose fragment you have a whole void anteriorly so it is better to wait and let it gum up a little bit and then you can think of doing it absolutely not uh, that easy to serve it probably give you more that you see this patient is 65 years okay he yeah. uh, you can know that how much will be his activity if we see this fracture now what the nail has been put let us not go into the technicalities what went wrong but you see that there is not much of the overriding there is not much of the angulation and if one would like to the target should be that we should try to achieve the union at this place by any method so somebody will say you now take out this nail is not very really satisfactory and i will uh, redo the same thing i'll do a plating and all those you can do it patient may not agree this is the type of the patient i am telling you now if you put them into a uh, take him to the conservative line of treatment back from this position put them into a knee cast bracing they start knee mobilization and start ankle mobilization 
and allow a partial weight bearing and gradually go to the pelvis. So your utter survive, this vector will unite. And this is what you're looking for. It. This is what you're looking for. It. You want to fracture to unite. And this is what you're looking for in this phase, rather than going and doing a redo surgery. But Definitely. I think that's what we went. Four yeah. weeks later. I mean, I'll give, I did not give any functional cost based. I give, give above knee cost, long less cost, and non weight wearing. And this is at four weeks. Uh, what to do again? There was an issue, but I waited actually. Continue to wait eight weeks. Follow up eight weeks. I removed the plaster and started mobilizing. There's some callus formation already occurring at both views. So clinically, patient was better. There was not much tenderness or abnormal mobility. Waited further. So this is at three months. Uh, I think we are reasonably okay. I mean, clinically, patient was quite okay. Though at this X-ray, final X-ray at five months, there is a, some varus actually. Significantly, but this nail was not impinging clinically. So that was something positive. Unfortunately, only negative part at this stage is some various persistent, which I think uh, should have been corrected. Any that comments? Is uh, Abdul, uh, you see, that's what I was trying to say. Uh, you gave a long leg plaster. Okay, you converted it into long leg plaster. That's what I was saying that instead of giving a long leg plaster, you could have given into a knee brace. So they would yeah. have been having a full, he would have a, he, he must be having a, some stiffness of the knee joint and would have taken a long time for the knee physiotherapy to be done. And Absolutely. otherwise, you see the whole objective has been achieved. That you wanted the fracture to unite in a 65 years man in which you did not want to offer him a second surgery. So what are the options left for this thing? So these are the some things where you can really uh, get the help of these things which can help the patient. So okay. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure my both cases would have made you happier actually that we are still following your philosophy, even yeah, yeah. so-called modern surgeons. You see, so, what I'm uh, what I'm trying to say uh, here, I would uh, uh, when the uh, in the beginning, uh, Abdul, you made in a very good comment on this. this thing, that you see, the uh, we are the what my teacher used to say, we are the custodian. Are in our age group, we are the custodian of the medical education. You see, our uh, whole energy should be training our youngsters yeah. in all aspects of the orthopedics, both operative, middle path, and non-operative treatment by plaster technique, so that they should know and try to emphasize them to go and do the operation. Such a neck of femur must go and do the operation. Now, preventive fracture must go and do the operation. Who is not? I'm not saying not. But where you can avoid operation, please do that and try colorative treatment. You'll get a very good thing. Absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think Thank I'm you. done. Yeah. Over to you, Dr. Rajesh. Yeah, Dr. Rajesh, you're muted. I think, yes. Okay, okay, fine. Yeah, unmuted. So we have finished all the thing. If there are any any other questions from the participants, we can go ahead. Otherwise, we'll call it a day. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank sir, you. sir, wait, wait, sir, wait, sir, wait. any questions from the audience? Uh, uh, no. Just a minute. Let me have a look. One second. If there are come in the last few minutes. Yeah. All must have learned, you know, plaster techniques very well. Or there are no viewers. Are there any viewers? Nein, nein, very good. There are many a lot viewers. of viewers, almost 500. The audience themselves are the expert on this technique. <laughs> 400 on Ortho TV and 100 on YouTube. 500 approximately. 500 is okay, you know. Last, last these, week. 500 these days is a big number. So many no, sir. Last, last week I was I was watching in a webinar, you know. There were 64 and at the end there were 30 only. Yeah, so, so I, is a very big number. I thought today may not be 20. <laughs> 500 is quite a good number. That one plaster, plaster cases. The NK is rising. No, sir. Uh, you are also rising. <laughs> no, I think we are done. We are done, sir. Thank you. So, at the end, I must thank, you know, uh, thank Professor Taneja, Dr. Sanjay Dar, you know, uh, Dr. Gani, uh, my younger brother Sanjeev, and, you know, I must thank you, Neeraj and, uh, you know, Ashok for your wonderful effort, you know, and we may continue with this series. Uh, we'll plan some, uh, something, you know, on this again.
after a week or so after 10 days let us see we'll discuss okay. sir at least twice a month we should have jammu kashmir series that is what we should plan we'll it. going to continue on plaster only maybe uh, next uh, next one or two i'll let you know on what topic and then okay. uh, you know we we'll go ahead with that okay. 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 Okay